When the world has got you down and Alzheimer's sucks. It's an equal opportunity disease that chips away at everything we hold dear. And to date, there's no cure. So until there is, we continue to fight with the most powerful tool in our arsenal, love. This is Love Conquers Alls, a real and really positive podcast that takes a deep dive into everything Alzheimer's, the good, the bad, and everything in between. And now, here are your hosts, Susie Singer-Carter and me, Don Priest. Hi, I'm Susie Singer-Carter. And I'm Don Priest, and this is Love Conquers Alls. Hello, Susan. Hi, Donald. How are you? Flustered this morning. It took yeah, me it's been like a crazy 10 morning. takes to say good morning. I don't know what's going on. Well, just wait till I have to read uh, our, our guest introduction. It's going to be, oh my good. <laughs> it's going to be crazy. There's words uh, in there. There's, there's a lot words of words. And, there's and words that words we don't know. Hard. They're hard words. They're, They're hard. Because you know why? She's, a, why? she's smart. She's smart. Super She's smart. very smart, yeah. Way smarter yeah. than... She's I, so she's... smart, you guys. Get ready. <laughs> she's smart. So what's happening? She's lovely. Um, I had my flu shot yesterday, so any ex- any kinds of mistakes or faux pas or, you know, bad pallor, I'm blaming on the flu shot because I have an excuse. Right. You've had a crazy week, haven't you? Yes, I have. My daughter made a new human. A human being, yeah. Wow. A little human named Georgia Lovey, and Lovey was my mom's nickname growing up and all through her adulthood, and my my daughter honored her with that name. So we have a little a little Georgie in our family, and she looks exactly like my daughter when she was born, and she weighed the exact same weight and the and she measured the exact same length. Really. And may I add that she is olive tone with brown hair just like my mom i'm just saying <laughs> you are just saying <laughs> i'm just saying so yeah it has been a year of losses and gains and and such is life but yeah. um yeah here we I, are i would get i would get very trite and say the circle of life but i will not do that where's my yorkie he's always good for that i don't think we have the budget for these songs so don i've never been in a community like this that's so so enriching i feel like i'm learning all the time and i'm i'm feeling heard all the time it just makes you feel good and this this guest in particular her perspective on this disease, Alzheimer's and dementia, and um, the journey and the loss is so mirror to what the way I feel. It's so validating to ha- hear somebody else have that perspective who's already gone through what I'm going through right now. I can't wait to share that with everybody. So why don't you introduce our very amazing guest? Absolutely. Our amazing guest today is Professor Cindy Weinstein. And she is currently the Eli and Edith Broad Professor of English at the California Institute of Technology. Uh, Since 1989, she has had several administrative roles at Caltech, including Vice Provost and Chief Diversity Officer. In 2018 and 19, she was an Atlantic Fellow in the Global Brain Health Institute based at UCSF and Trinity College Dublin, where she studied neurology with an interdisciplinary group of scientists, artists, social scientists, and physicians. She's published three monographs on American literature, taught classes on Herman Melville, Edgar Allan Poe, women's fiction, and African-American literature. But most recently, she has shared her personal stories and professional expertise in a humorous yet poignant memoir, Finding the Right Words, a reflection upon her father's experience with early-onset Alzheimer's, in conversation with the distinguished neurologist, Dr. Bruce Miller. It's a truly intimate and illuminating work that ventures to explain how this disease attacks the brain. And we are so looking forward to learning more, so let us not wait any longer. Please (laughs) welcome and say hello to Professor Cindy Weinstein. Hello, Cindy. Hi, Cindy. It's so great to have you here. What an honor to have you. What a brilliant mind and what a big heart you have. Thank you. I feel very much the same way. I, your podcast is extraordinary. 
uh, the way it combines information and emotion and humor. Uh, it's just a beautiful thing you're giving to oh, the community. Thank you. So well, thank, thank you. you for this too. This great book that I'm, I'm, I'm still, I'm, I'm going through it bit by bit. First of all, it's delightful, and second of all, there's so much good information mm -hmm. in it. And being able to use the literature as a metaphor and using that as a tool, we forget how powerful metaphors are. I use it as a filmmaker all the time. I really highly recommend this book, you guys. I really do. Finding the Right Words. It's really good. And mm -hmm. um, if you've been through this journey, there's so much in it that will, will resonate with you and, and also enlighten you as to what you and your person were going through at the at each stage it's, it's brilliant it's a brilliant it's a brilliant concept so yes yes so I want to dive in so bad there's so much I want to say I've earmarked some things from your book that I want to talk about but why don't you share your story of your father who had early onset Alzheimer's and give us just a brief background on on that because I everyone's everyone's origin story is a little different sure my father was uh, diagnosed with Alzheimer's in the 80s. I was in graduate school at Berkeley from 1982 to 89, and a few years in, I was realizing that something was wrong with my dad. In the book, the first chapter is diagnosis, and I uncovered the fact that I sort of knew something was wrong before we officially got the diagnosis. And I noticed in particular a word finding difficulty and the conversations that I used to have with my dad, I was very, very close to him. They became monosyllabic. My dad would just give my mom the phone. They were in Florida at the time and the communication was not what it used to be. And I also noticed that in those days when you wrote letters to people or typed letters, my dad's typing was full of typos and his handwriting was even worse than it used to be. Right. He never had very good handwriting to begin with. And my parents would visit me in Berkeley and the origin story for the book really was uh, a trip to the supermarket in Berkeley. And my father wanted something in the salad for dinner and didn't know the word for it. And it turned out what he wanted was crouton. And I describe in a chapter on word finding, just sort of the horror of seeing the disease expressed in that way and the synchronicity of my father losing words while I was becoming an English professor right. and gaining expertise in words right. was something I had been chewing on for decades and knew that I needed to come to terms with it in some way and that was the first part of the book that I wrote the story about trying to help my dad get to a word. Now, it's interesting because we all lose words, right? I do it all the time. And of course, with my mom having Alzheimer's, I panic each and every time. And, right. and so, you know, it's, it's a really, is there anything that you could enlighten anybody listening that might be also, you know, searching for a word and I know sometimes it comes from being tired or overworked or not sleeping enough and, and we, can, we lose words. Don and I do it all the time. When is it a problem? When should we worry about it? I studied neurology for a year and as I tell my friends, that can be a dangerous thing. So to answer your question, uh, I, really, I really have difficulty answering that question. I guess there are different problems people have with words. And I remember Bruce explaining to me, there's the version where the word is just gone. There's the version where you have the dictionary in your brain, but you can't get to the right page. There's a version where 
like biologically you can't say the word that there's right. something happening aphasia your, exactly right, mm -hmm. right. So I'm going to answer a slightly different question, and if that's okay. Oh, and sure, sure. Yeah, first, and, and I think, but just, can I just say that, but I want to inject and just say that I, I hear what you're saying, and, and I notice that, and, and I think that even with my mom at the end stage, when she was, had lost her ability to speak, other than she said, I love you to me, loud and mm -hmm. clear, I saw her searching for the words. I saw her look to the right, try to try to think of something, and then come back to me, and it was gone. Right. You know, and I know it was gone because I'd say to her, I see you. I see you looking for those words. You got words right. for me, don't you? And she would just squeeze my hand. i go, you know, so I knew that it's almost like the second thing that you had mentioned, you know, like the word is there. She just can't, she can't connect it. And when she said, I love you, I said to her, holy shit, that was a huge thing you just did. For her to pull those words together and actually get them out of her mouth was a gift. So I, I do, I hear you loud and clear. I'm so glad you got that. And I would just say that one of the ironies of writing the book and looking back on it is me realizing that Words are important and I love them, but they're not all they're cracked up to be. And so even though my father couldn't say I love you, I knew it. It didn't matter. And that's been an interesting thing to get to after writing this book, which is, you know, a letter to how much I love my dad, how much I love literature, how much I love language, uh, to realize the limitations of that. But what I was going to say is I read this book by Lisa Genova. Who, yes, I know Lisa. Yeah. Yeah. And she talks about the anxiety people have when they can't find a word and, oh my God, what's happening to me? And what I really liked about one of the chapters she wrote about was like, it's okay to use technology. Like Sometimes instead of like going into a tailspin, especially if you have a relative with dementia in the family, uh, just like go on Google and just look it up. I do it and all the time. Do it I all love the time my thesaurus. Too, yeah. Thank you, thesaurus. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Love you. Love it. It's the best. Yeah, right. no, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. You because have to yeah. yourself tests that you might fail because that's just going to. That doesn't help anybody. It doesn't right. help anybody. You're so right. That's beautiful. And just because you're you've lost the you know some of that skill, you know, I think you have to look at other behaviors before you start saying, "Oh my gosh, I have Alzheimer's." It's it's not just losing words. There's other right. obviously other issues that are going on, and I think you have to combine that those the sure. two before you start saying, "Oh my God, I have Alzheimer's." Right. Because I can't think of a word. Yeah. yeah. So. Think about all the stress you're under. Think about the cortisol that's running through your, <laughs> coursing through your body sometimes. That sometimes can you're really... just thinking about more than one thing at a time. You well, know, it's, yeah, I find like, that's true it's too. like when you suddenly, like sometimes when you sit, sit in a room and go, why am I here? Why was I going over here? It's because you're thinking about something else. Right. right. So yeah, we shouldn't panic immediately when those things start happening. You have to look at the big picture and some of the other behaviors. Okay, might... Steve. Yeah. I'm just... You're... <laughs> And it also could be you're tired and you're not getting enough sleep and you need a CPAP or yep. you're not hearing as well <laughs> as you need to. And so think about getting hearing aids. And now with the new law that was passed that you can get hearing aids over the counter. Yes. Huge. Amazing. So, yeah. yeah. Can I say something to you, Cindy, just in terms of like your dad? You know he said, I love you all the time. You don't only have to, and I say this to people, and I want to just say it to you, is that you only have to look at a baby to know when a baby loves you without right. words. Right. Well before they can talk, well before they can, they know any word. And you know whether they love you or whether they're afraid of you or whether they're nervous or you can, you can read so much without words. You can do that with pets. You know, we don't have words with pets, but we can look at them in the eye and they know, and we know what they know. So, Absolutely. right? And so there's so much to be said about, you know, um, just nonverbal communication. 
is is powerful. Words are beautiful. Words are great. There, yes. but we don't need them to communicate. Yeah. People who, who speak totally different languages can communicate with each other. You right. know, <laughs> just the yeah. the words are. You know, we, we are we have more going on up here that that allows us to to communicate without without actually hearing them. So, yeah, I think right. the, the words are overrated. Is is right on. I feel like this is such an obvious question, but what led you to writing Finding the Right Word? I wanted to write the story of my father and how much I loved this person. And it took me a really long time to figure out how I was going to tell that story. There are, as you know, many memoirs about dementia, about Alzheimer's, and I wanted the book I wrote not only to tell the story of my grief and the story of my father's illness and in the last chapter, the story, the funny stories, everything I just adored about my dad and we can talk about how I kind of recovered those memories. But I also wanted to use the book as a way to help readers. And I think because I've been at Caltech for so long, I wanted the voice of science, of a doctor. I wanted to give the readers information about dementia in a way that was reader friendly. And I wanted images in the book so that when a family goes to the primary care physician or the neurologist, it wouldn't be the first time that they would see a pet or they would hear the word parietal lobe or they would hear the word primary progressive aphasia. I, I almost wanted to arm the reader with language because it's so scary, you know, usually going into the doctor's office and much of the power is on one side. Although I have some ideas about how to level that out a little bit. And so it took me a while to find Bruce. I initially wanted, I thought maybe I could work with someone at Caltech. We don't really do very much work on dementia. Uh, we're starting to do research on Parkinson's, but uh, less on Alzheimer's, frontotemporal dementia, um, mm -hmm. Lewy body. And so I thought I was going to work with someone at UCLA. And she then... Uh, developed a writing block, so that didn't work. And then I found someone at Santa Barbara, and he really liked the idea, but these scientists are constantly traveling. Every time I had a conversation with him, it was in, it was in an airport because he was <laughs> off to, you know, some country. That doesn't and sound that, different. It's not too different from our industry. There you go, yeah. <laughs> and then that person sent me to Bruce uh, Miller, and I sent an email to Bruce. I told him my idea. I met with him. We really hit it off. And he said to me the magic words, do you want to learn some science? And I said, yes, I do. Because I had worked so long, Susie, with what you were saying, sort of literature as a metaphor yes. for grief and sadness. But I knew I needed another language to tell the story of my father's illness and also to make sense of my relation to it. And I had a feeling that if I learned some neurology and worked with a researcher, I would be able to do what I needed to do to tell the story. It's so smart and it's so beautiful and it's so novel because I haven't seen anything else like this. So that, you know, you have the personal anecdote, which is what it, what grabs us and then you've got this wonderful ranuncular kind of guy who who's like yeah want to learn some science it's like oh, you Bill know Nye. Bill Nye. Nye. it's like that you've got yeah. this guy who's like <laughs> loves it so much that he's just you know bringing you into his world let me tell you why that's happening and that's it's such so a true. great thing because it's it you know it makes it accessible for for those of us that aren't academic and it's just perfect 
I just, I and mean, it, it really, demystifies, yeah, it demystifies yeah. this thing that you're like, oh, it's the brain. How, oh, so this is what's happening. How do we understand right. that? Yeah, so, so that's, it's really a, a, a beautiful structure. <laughs> that yeah, you and created. I mean, and it's, there's so much about like the brain and also just about science in general, you know, that I, I, I always say that there's, you know, there's the science and the data, and then there's the individual. And there's a, something magical about the individual that can trump the data sometimes. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. why we have to be, we, we need to be informed on, in all areas so that we can say, okay, there's the data, but who's this person we're dealing with? Are, you know, what is their strengths and what is their you know, cognitive reserve that, that's going to steer them in a different direction than say that person? Right. Right. And I and I I love that because it doesn't throw us all into the same box. Right. I uh, a couple things I just to respond to that. I wanted to give information via Bruce uh, to educate people about the science and also about the grief process and what it might look like. The thing is that a lot of people can't get to UCSF. Uh, and there are people in rural communities, there are uh, underrepresented populations that have difficulty getting into these clinical trials. And there are a lot of researchers who are working very hard on diversity, equity, and inclusion with respect to these trials. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to be able to give people access to Bruce through this book and to his expertise. And the program that I was in is called the Global Brain Health in Initiative, is devoted in large part to uh, access around the world. And so the program that I was in, people were from uh, Botswana, Jamaica, Peru, Brazil. It was extraordinary. Wow. Uh, it makes me feel so happy that there's that much interest all over. Well, there's so many people that, at least in, in my circle, that don't want to look at this, don't care to look at it. And, you know, there's a lot of la 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 going on. Right. I, I, I'm guilty of it, too, for a long time. Yeah, you, you don't know? want to face, you know, no. so it's, sometimes it's easier to just say, you know, I'll, I'll close my eyes. And if I don't see it, it's not there. It's not there. And it's there. Well, the film you did with Valerie Harper um, is just beautiful and uh, uh, just really, really gorgeous. So oh, that was you. such a gift, such a gift. Um, thank you. Yes. Yeah. I say that yes because I say Valerie, Valerie, that was her last performance and she, she just dove in and yes. embodied my mom. It's like she put her on. She went, gotcha, Norma. I'm in there. And just bought, right. embodied her, and and you know, uh, she her 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 connection with that story was just extraordinary. Her connection, you could tell. yeah, yeah. What I loved also about the movie, it really confirmed something that Bruce talks about with dementia, and that is when certain parts of the brain aren't working as well as they might, other parts light up. And so he has a theory, and I think has data to, to support it, that the empathy circuitry in uh, Alzheimer's gets really activated even more uh, in the absence of language and other parts of the disease and so the moment in the film where your mom played by Valerie is talking to the trans person and that just blew my mind that was just just magnificent just to see the ability her ability to even in her own illness to make someone feel so good and so whole and so loved was just spot on she tapped oh, into her mother, her motherly instinct. I love the scene. I just have to say, when she's worried that the caregiver has stolen something, she's looking in in a cabinet. Yes. My um, we had a lot of yadro 
in our house <laughs> in New Jersey. Well, that's what I that was. A, yeah. yeah, I think maybe it's a certain time period. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That resonated. Just that detail was so perfect. <laughs> oh, good. It, I'm so glad. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting I, because we found, you know, as when we did the movie, you know, we had just we were the only ones who had seen it. And we were like, is anyone going to relate to any of this? It's so personal. And you realize, and I think you probably realize this with your book, there's so much shared experience. Even though it's a completely unique yeah. moment, the right. experience itself is a shared experience. Right. And that's why it's so interesting when you when you hear it from Bruce's reasoning why that is right. you know that's that's so there's there's i'd love for bruce to just watch our film and explain it all to us it would be great oh wouldn't that be good <laughs> we should do that that would be so fun Cindy, to go, to scene, have, by go moment by scene by moment by scene and have him explain what's going on that would be gorgeous which is what I your will, book does i will report yeah. back no yeah no we should all the four of us should get together that would be so great that you know it would be great, would yeah. be great. but you know so we talked about the structure of your book, which I love your structure of it. I love the stories that, that touch our hearts, that make us laugh, that make us cry, you know, and, and your love for your father is so palpable. But I need to ask why Moby Dick was such a, a huge part of this narrative and why does that in particular speak to you? I'm teaching Moby Dick right now, actually. Are you? And yeah, uh, teaching a class on Melville, which is which is wonderful. I read Moby Dick for the first time when I was 16. And I was the kind of student, like if the teacher said, oh, this is like the hardest book, like, don't don't work on this, because you'll never understand it. It was like, that's the thing that I wanted to figure out. So I read it in high school for the first time, and then I read it again in college, twice. And I think part of it, there, there's a lot going into it, but one of the things has to do with the people I was reading it with, my teachers. I loved my teachers, and they pushed me to understand this really complicated book and then when my dad got sick they weighed in on how I might want to think about pursuing my career putting my career on hold so the novel itself uh, is is important to me both because I love the book and I'll talk about that in a minute but also mm -hmm in relation to where I was at particular times in my life when I was reading it. So mm. there's that. And what I also discovered is with each rereading, I would get something new out of the book. My favorite thing to do with my students is just to take a paragraph or two and walk them through how Melville gets from point A to point B how he enacts Ralph Waldo Emerson's transcendental ideas in the novel. Just the language is just gorgeous. So I love talking to my students about that. It's a really funny book and I love bringing out the humor with my students because I think there's a, there's a way that people are sort of frightened of the book and it's really fun to work with students to get them to sort of take the novel off of its pedestal. But I, the main thing is the story of Ishmael and Ahab. And I can kind of, over the years, I was able to take my emotional temperature <laughs> based <laughs> on which character I was identifying with. And Ishmael is really funny and very process oriented and he doesn't really care if he gets to a conclusion or not the fun of it for him is just trying to figure it out and writing about it whereas Ahab thinks he's got it all figured out and mm -hmm. he's full of anger and fear and authority 
And when I've identified with Ahab's pain too much, and this was really the case when my father was first diagnosed, like I understood Ahab in a way that I wish I had never been able to mm. understand, like wanting to get out in the world and destroy something that represented the thing that was causing me so much pain. Wow. And when I was feeling better, um, I was able to embrace Ishmael's position. And so it, it's just been a kind of guidepost for me throughout my life. And one of my favorite chapters in the novel is Ishmael describes the ability of the whale. Its eyes are placed on either side of the head and that the whale can hold two completely different pictures in its mind at one time. And I think that that is something I have aspired to as I've come to terms with my father's illness, the ability to see the terrible things, the really sad things, the really painful things, which I confronted in finding the right words, but then also the wonderful things. The gifts. About God. Yes. The gifts. The when, when, yeah. what, what Bruce said, and I say it in my rudimentary way, is that, you know, when, when some, as some skills leave, others are replaced by other right. things that are, that are stronger and more, and more potent, and they are the gifts. Right. They are the gifts, like, you, like the empathy that, that gets pumped. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting because I have shied away from classics because of just what you said. I, I so want to take your class now. <laughs> I do. I mean, I just I just started reading Crime and Punishment for the first time because it scared the oh. hell out of me. And, uh. and, and I thought I need to read something that's, you know, scary and mm -hmm. because I need to, to, to test myself and challenge myself. And I'm not sure I like it. I'm, I'm halfway through. I'm not sure yeah. it, it was the best first choice of that kind of, of uh, literature, but <laughs> I'm Good still trying you. to wrap my head about, around huh? the characters and, and they're, they're not very likable. And I'm trying to find the <laughs> what you I'm know supposed that, to take away yeah. with. You, you, no, I was just going to say that, you know, you just said that you that literature to help you understand your, you know, your father's suffering, your own pain. But um, you've also said that it allowed you to deny what was happening. How does yeah, that work? It was complicated. Uh, I think that. And this is such an English professor thing to say, like it did both. It allowed me to pour my energy into understanding other people's pain because literature is often about grief and about pain and so i would be reading i don't know lolita uh an american tragedy by dreiser and just the act of moving my attention away from my dad and what was happening with him to something else was sort of a, a way for me to kind of temporarily deny or put to the side what was going on with my father. At the same time as the books I was most attracted to, Moby Dick being probably number one, uh, there was like a, it was like the door was ajar in the novel to let me in just very small doses, uh, uh, think about what was happening with my dad. So it was a funny combination of, I don't need to think about what's happening. I can throw my, my brain into this other endeavor at the same time as it was a window into my own grief. Ah, that's Don't so you think strong. that's that's healthy? I, I think that's almost. I mean, you say it because the way it's uh, when you say you know that 
you're denying what's happening. I think you're just distracting from what's happening. I think that's healthy yeah. sometimes. Your brain, you need to get away from it sometimes. Well, you need it like to take it, I think, in little doses. And right. I think I'm doing the same thing by throwing myself into this documentary. I don't, do you have your book handy by any chance? I do. Would you go to page 102? Look at yeah. this. I'm going to do a production here. <laughs> I would love you to read at the bottom of page 102 because you shared this passage online, which had me. You're like my sister because of this. And I felt like everything you wrote was my experience. And by the way, she actually uses hairball as a, uh, a ter- an adjective which dog, is, which I, I use think, too. I think last, I think last, uh, yes. I think last show we had hairball in our last show. Yes, and Don <laughs> Don said hairball, and I said, yeah, you know, like a hairball. Yeah. Yes, she gets it. This is my sis. This is my girl. Okay, we get each other. Thank you. <laughs> would you Would you mind reading that? And and because I think it's it it really sure. illuminates probably what a lot of us go through that that are have lost loves of our lives but back to the part where i forgot my father was dying a cognitive maneuver that even decades later leaves me reeling in its utter strangeness perhaps this forgetting is the very definition of denial self-protection and self-immolation all rolled up into one psychic hairball anyway here's what i think happened I had become so used to visiting him in nursing homes over the decade or so that felt like a lifetime that at some point I think I convinced myself that this was the way things were going to be, were always going to be. This was life. Looking back, I now now realize it was also death. I'm pretty sure I never thought about how my father would die. Maybe some people do, but I somehow knew how he wouldn't. The start date certainly wasn't sometime during his 50s, and the end date wasn't 70. And because the way he was dying wasn't the way he was supposed to, even though exactly how he was supposed to uh, remained uh, an unanswered and unposed question, I refused to acknowledge fully what was happening. I say fully because on the margins of consciousness I knew, but I could only know for a second or two, and then the knowing had to stop. Therefore, to To use a word that denotes logic, even though the thought process I am describing seems crazy, as he was getting older, I managed to lose track of the passage of time. His sickness froze froze him in time and paralyzed me. Oddly, I could still do my academic work. In fact, I thrived. The paralysis was localized, but it went to the deepest part of me. So even as his death was happening, I didn't know it, grasp it, grieve it. Turns out I'd given myself an anesthetic that has taken about 30 years to wear off. Wow. So mm. there, that's it in a nutshell for me as well. Yeah. And I think that's what this disease does, is that it, 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 it's so intense and there's so much to it and it's so very long for a lot of people that, that you can easily forget that your person is dying. It's so weird because Uh as Don said, Alzheimer's is many things. It's not just word finding, it's not just memory. Although I thought it was just memory when I started at UCSF. But the strange thing, at least for me, and Susie, I don't know if this is the case for you, is I started forgetting. Like, my memory was affected Mm -hmm. by what was happening. Mm -hmm. And that sort of mirroring relationship was another thing I wanted to kind of sort through in the book as much as I could. Mm -hmm. That, for example, my father would have difficulty in space. So I have a chapter on spatial disorientation. And... I thought Berkeley was my space, my home, but I was completely disoriented when I was there. <laughs> so just that, as I said, mirroring kind of thing. Susie, I, I don't know if you have that experience. I have, you. what's odd is like, I'm think as you're saying that, I'm thinking about my, the consistent theme of my dreams is always me trying to find out where I'm at and figure out where I am mm-hmm. all wow. the time. 
Wow. And I share that with Dawn all the time. I'm somewhere. I can't figure out where to go. It's how usually to get... a strange house. It's usually it's a, a strange, strange house, house or a strange rooms. building, a building that yeah. I'm working at. You know, I'm, I'm, it's, it's some huge venue that I'm at. And, and for some reason, I cannot find my way back. It's been at universities. Like, it'll be the UCLA, but it's not UCLA. And I'm, mm. I'm trying to find the entrance and the exit. And, and I can't. I can't figure out the space. So it's yeah. interesting that you said it, and it's reoccurring all the time. I have it. I had it last night. I've not it's heard very that interesting. before. Yeah, as far yeah. as Yeah, and I the... think that with that, the stage of, like, my mom being at the home and, and being in her wheelchair for so long, and, you know, that stage just felt like it was never going to change. And I right. just, I never thought about how is she going to die. I never thought that. I just kept thinking, how are we going to make everything as comfy and as lovely and as wonderful as possible? Right. What would be the hardest chapter you had to write and why was it so difficult? The behavior chapter was the hardest part to write. And the passage that I just read is from that. And there were a couple reasons that was so hard. Each chapter in its own way was very, very difficult. It's funny because I think for Bruce, the behavior chapter is probably the easiest one because his area of expertise is frontotemporal dementia, which is quite behavioral in terms of how it presents. Mm -hmm. And so I had told each chapter, Bruce was great because like I would tell him a story and he would say, okay, Cindy, that's a chapter. You need to write about that. And I could give some other examples of it, but the one in the behavior chapter, um, I remember my father pulled a sink out of the wall in his nursing home room. And Bruce was like, you need to talk about that. And so the behavior chapter was, I think, especially hard to write because all of the most of the behaviors I write about were ones that I learned about in a secondhand fashion. And so revisiting memories of that also reminded me, as if I needed a reminder, that unlike you, Susie, um, I was really far away from my dad when he was suffering so mm. much. And a lot of the book is uh, about the guilt that comes along with that decision to remain away and pursue one's dream, even though I knew that my mother and father never would have wanted me to give up that dream right. and move to Florida and help take care of him. That's not what they wanted, uh, but you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. Right. So the behavior chapter was especially hard because I had to continually reconfront the decision I had made to stay away. And also the behavior that I wanted to get at, that I wanted to write, was a very painful one, which was this sound that my father made. Oh, I read that, yes. Um, it's it's called bruxism, which is like a grinding, gnashing of teeth. And I think there there's some research about dementia and bruxism and whether it's part of the disease or, re, or a reaction to the medication. That's always like a big question. And Susie, I know you've mm -hmm. talked a lot about that. But my dad made this sound, which wasn't words mm -hmm. and I wanted to get back to that sound and confront it and hear it fully which means emptying my mind of a lot of the other noise that I had packed into my mind so I wouldn't hear that sound and that was very important for me to write because that, that was probably maybe the hardest memory was the sound uh, and the image I have of my father making it. 
but it was almost like a breakthrough because once I heard it, I feel like I had confronted like maybe the deepest demon. And then I was able to write the chapter on memory, which was a remembrance of my father before he started making that terrible sound. Wow. So, Cindy, I mean, yeah. isn't, isn't it Arthur Miller, this one of my favorite passages, when he talks about embracing your idiot child? Do you know that one? I, I don't. Okay, so he talks about, and it's been a, so so powerful, and it's what you're saying. It's He said, you know, sometimes the, the uh, I'm going to bastardize him, so sorry, Mr. Miller, but it's, it's um, you know, sometimes the house smells of uh, baked bread, and the other times it smells like burning flesh. And, and when it does, I turn and there's this despicable, ugly, horrible child chasing after me. And I'm, all, I'm running away and running away. And I can't get away and I keep turning back and I can't look at this child because he's so disgusting looking. And he said, and finally, ultimately, finally, one day I just turned and embraced that child. Mm. And I realized that that idiot child was me. Right. Yep. That's, Yeah. Um, I just have to say that it, it's um, very gratifying that the story that I tell is resonating. It makes me sad that it resonates because I know what that course, means in terms yeah. of people's pain. But I was always worried that the story of a girl from New Jersey, middle class, Jewish, you know, becomes an English professor. Like, like, can I, can I write that story and write, you know, my love for my dad in such a way that people will find themselves in the story? And you know that I mean, you're like the ideal reader, Susie. Um, <laughs> yes. You're too dumb. You're too dumb, but especially Susie. Yes. Um, just. You know, I'm just very gladdened by that. When oh. you tell the truth, when you tell the truth, the, it will resonate. You know, does, whether, yeah. you know, like, right. like we were saying with our film, yeah. we didn't think anyone would relate to it. That's and... true, yeah. <laughs> Phil Rosenthal, who is the showrunner and the creator of Everybody Loves Raymond, and he always says, you know, writing from what you know is the most powerful, and right. that the way to reach the most people is in the details. The tiny little right. details that you think that nobody's going to, you know, like, right. you know, he, and he always uses the example of like at Christmas, he would give his parents every year or Hanukkah every year, give her, give them like a, a, a fruit of the month club gift. And, and every time they'd say, it's great. Why don't do that anymore. Don't give it. We don't want this too much fruit. Like, what are we going to do with all this fruit? It's a lot of fruit. It's a lot of oranges every month. Phil, don't do that. Ma, everybody loves share it with people. Anyway, he, he wrote that into, the, into one of the episodes. And he said, you think anybody else had that exact same thing? No, but everybody gets it because it's so real. And it's yeah. the details of it. And I think that's the power that we have as storytellers, whether yes. we're you know, authors or screenwriters or songwriters, anybody that is telling a story. If it's authentic, like you said, Dawn, and it's and it's and it is detailed. I think it's it does resonate. It'll hit, yeah, you know, and it becomes a metaphor. Like you've never been with a whale, have you? I don't think. I, I, I have. <laughs> I have seasickness. So. <laughs> so there you go. So there you go. <laughs> there you go. I rest my yeah. case. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, we had people literally to, at the at the festivals come up to us. I mean, you know, we've our story is pretty specific, and it's called, right. and you know, like the, here's this teenage girl and her mother, and she's like. You told our story. We're like, what? Mm -hmm. How right. did we? How did what you just saw tell your story? Right. And I'm sure, and, and I'm interested to see if you've gotten that type of feedback from your book. The feedback's really been amazing. And readers have written to me and said, thank you. You've put words to the experience. Really appreciate that. And that feedback has given me a kind of raison d'etre, yes. which is to do as much outreach with the book as, as I can. And so reaching out to you, Susie, was an example of that. And 
doing podcasts, uh, which I had never done before. I'd never been on social media before. Uh, we had a publicist for the book, and she was great. And Johns Hopkins has been terrific. But there's a limited amount of time that sure. they can put into publicity. Sure. And so I've had a chance to talk sometimes with Bruce, sometimes by myself, with caregivers. I go to senior centers and talk about dementia and the book medical humanities groups. There are these things you, you may have heard of. They're called Alzheimer's Disease Research Centers. They're about 32 in the US. Many of them have outreach programs, book clubs, and so I've been working with them to spread Wonderful. the word. And I feel like my dad, I, I, I at one point I was like, we had a hard time finding a publisher for the book. So when both of you sort of applaud the structure of it. I really appreciate that. But there were many publishers that didn't want to take a chance on it. Yeah. Because it was too strange and how would it be described on Amazon? Uh, it's in the muscu musculoskeletal section on Amazon. Lord knows why. Oh, oh my gosh. Goodness. Oh Please. my goodness. <laughs> and so at a certain point when we were having trouble finding a publisher, I was like, I wrote this thing. If it never gets published, so be it. And then various things happened and we were able to get the book with Johns Hopkins, which was fantastic. And I think my dad would want his experience to be used to help others. So I keep that in mind when I get a little worried and Susie, I don't know if you feel this way about telling your mom's story, like yes. instrumentalizing it, yes. making it useful yes. in some way. I don't yes. know. I, I think that, about it. I, I talk about that a lot. I have a big problem with um, exploiting our yes. people. I, exactly. I have a very big problem with that. And I, and there's a fine line. Yes. There's a very fine line of it. And I, and I, I take umbrage to when I see it, I know it. When it's when it's when it feels ex exploitative to me, I feel it and it hurts. Huh. I don't like it at all. And I and and there is a lot of that in the community now. I've no, I it didn't used to be like that, but it's more and more. Uh. And um, I I yeah, I, I'm I've been very I was very fearful of doing that and of using my mother's condition right. as as you know. As, as a tool, but when she was, when I was doing- Susie, you're the, frozen. Okay, it, it, it'll be fine, Don. It was fine last time. Okay. So Are come, you yeah, you, yeah. You, I think you're gonna say, uh, pick it up from very fearful. Okay, well, I was using very, my mother's, con yeah, yeah, go ahead. No, I was, so, I was fearful of using my mom's condition as, as, you know, as a vehicle. And, but when, when, I, when we had finished the film and we had the trailer together and I brought it to my mom and I showed her and I said, Mom, I made a movie about you. And, she, no. and I said, and do you remember Rhoda, Valerie Harper? And she said, yes. And I said, well, she's playing you. Why? And I said, well, because you're terrific. And she said, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> and I tell her all the time how many people were falling in love with her and that she was so powerful with her story. And I right. know that she would be happy with it. And I, I did it respectfully. I didn't, I feel, I didn't, you know, reveal anything that she would be ashamed of. Right. And that's, that, that's my, that's my barometer is I wouldn't uh -huh. want to do anything that she would be ashamed of. Even with my documentary coming up, I'm, I'm, I'm fearful, but I feel like what's going on in that situation is so egregious that that, uh, you know, we need to, we right. have to show what's going on. Oh my God, we've been talking for so, this is, I, I could know. talk another two hours with you. I just, Did yeah, thank, thank you. I, thank I'm you. sorry, we have to wrap up, but I just want to say thank you so much for writing this book. I am, I love thank it. I'm, I'm savoring it. I'm, I'm, I, and I will keep it. It's been by my bed, like since you sent it to me. And I love it, and I, I want everyone to get it. If you're not a reader, 
it's so easy to read. It's just, it's just oh. super. Yeah. Bruce is terrific the way that he describes what is going on. And, and I think that, you know, what's so beautiful is marrying those two perspectives. I think you did a, an extraordinary job and, and I applaud you mm -hmm. and I love yeah. you. And I think that, you know, and I want you to, I'm, I want you not I to feel guilty me. about, because you're, you're right, your dad wouldn't have wanted you to leave school. And my mm -hmm. mother, like she says in the movie, you have to put me in a home. You have to live your yes. life. Yes. Yeah. And that's, and I know just by the way you described your father, he felt the same way. So you did, you did him good. You did him proud and you Thank were you. there at the important time. Thank okay. You. And so, and so was I, 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 you know, I wasn't a helicopter daughter and, and even though we live in the same city, I saw my mom once a week cause I felt satisfied. But once I realized I was mistaken, you know, in terms of her care, that's when I, I decided I had to be there almost every day. But that's, that was my decision, I, and I gave into it because I knew, I, I, for me, not for my mom, for me and her. Right. But I mean, it, I, that's what I needed to be there. And right. so, and I, and I made a conscious decision. And, and that's, and I, and I don't regret it. But I also don't regret having to put her in the home because I had to. There was right. nothing that I couldn't do on my own, and that's the problem with our healthcare system. Yes. yes. So that's the problem. So don't I feel like you did you you've done your your daddy proud. Thank you. And he was a beautiful daddy. I saw the pictures of him as 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 the sporty dad, <laughs> and he is he's I I have a crush on him. I don't know. He's a good look. He's a good looking guy. I would have dated him. <laughs> He is so cute. He was a cutie. Super cutie pie. Yeah. Yeah. Was there anything else you wanted to add or say something we missed or you're good to go? Thing. <laughs> Perfect. Excellent. Great. Great. Well, it's, it's, it's apropos that you loved your dad so much. I love my mom so much. And you know, why, why is it so apropos, Donald? Well, that's because love is powerful. Love is contagious and love conquers alls. We thank everyone for for watching today. Please Listening. buy Cindy's book. Yes. We'll, we'll put up all the information. And, uh, you know, we'll see you next time. Like, subscribe, do all those fun things. And, and kiss uh, everyone definitely. that you love. Kiss them twice. Absolutely. Bye-bye. Right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.